On today's Join Us in France, an interview with Sandra Brown, who shares her secrets about visiting Paris using a wheelchair. This is Join Us in France, episode 109. Hello, I'm Annie, and Join Us in France is a show about all things French. I love France, I was born and raised in France, I live in France now, but I've also lived in the UK and the US for a couple of decades, so I have a unique perspective on my own country. I want to help you understand France better and get the most out of your next visit to France. And maybe you're just thinking about visiting France, and if that's the case, I hope you'll be a few steps closer to actually doing it after listening to this episode. Today, I want to send a big shout out to the many friends and listeners who have come on the show to do a trip report with me. For those who have been listening to the show for a long time, you already know that the show started out two plus years ago, give or take, with me and Elise doing one show every week. After nine months of that, she got too busy to continue at that pace. And so I produced many solo shows in a row, but those were taking a lot of time with all the research I had to do. And I also have a day job, so this was putting a lot of pressure on my time. Then I decided that maybe I should invite other tour guides to come on the show. And that was pretty good, but I had to go looking for people constantly and they didn't know me, so they weren't sure about this whole thing. Uh, it continued to be a, a very time-consuming affair for me. Then I interviewed friends of mine who were visiting us and touring around France, and I loved that. A fresh pair of eyes can really notice a lot of interesting stuff, and the listeners love the trip reports. So when that worked out so well, I thought, Maybe I should see if regular listeners that I don't know in real life would be interested in coming on the show to talk about their trip to France. And rather quickly, I had a few people offer to come on the program with me, and that made me very happy. So thank you so much for volunteering. I've done many of these trip reports, and I'm going to do many more. I have several lined up as I speak. There are a lot of experienced travelers who listen to this show and they have great things to contribute. Helping each other out is what it's all about after all, isn't it? So don't be shy. Send me an email if you too want to have a chat with me on the show. And thank you so much. It's really going to help keep the show going because you're bringing the material. It's fantastic. My guest for today's show is Sandra Brown. She is an Australian who lives in Paris and is a wheelchair user. She writes a blog called excusesversuslife.com where you can read all about her many adventures in France. You will find a link to her blog on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 109 to see photos and to and links to all the things that she recommends. And you know what? These things are great whether you are using a wheelchair or not. She has some wonderful tips for, for all of us today. So without further ado, here's Sandra Brown. Hello, Sandra. Bonjour, Annie. Bonjour. How are you? Uh, pretty good, thank you. It's a bit, still a bit cold here, but it's all right. The sun's out. Yeah, it's the same in Toulouse. I don't know what's happening. The spring just doesn't. No, I think come. someone is uh, stealing summer somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, it's the, we're recording this early April. It's not going to be released for a few weeks, but early April. Oh, it's just not. We're not there yet. No, there's just a bit too much rain. I think. <laughs> yes. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. So I have introduced you a little bit uh, before in the show, but I would like you to introduce yourself. Tell okay. us, you know, uh, where you're from, uh, everything that you can, that you would like to share with us. Where... All right. Well, I'm from Australia. Um, I grew up in a small country town. It was called, or it's still called, Kuirup. Mm. Which, is an, which is an Aboriginal name, um, which means blackfish swimming, I think. Mm. 
Um, there was only 1,150 people in the town when I was growing up, so it was very small. Mm. Um, but I moved to the city of Melbourne in my 20s. I'm very much a city girl. I like growing up in the country, but I prefer the buzz of the city. Sure. Um, in terms of my background briefly, I'm one of those people who has uh, several university degrees, but I don't work in any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not the only one like that, so hopefully a few listeners will be like, yep, I'm exactly the same as that. Yeah, it happens a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, I think um, I'm one of those people who was born to be a writer. It just took me a long time to realize that you can't fight what you meant to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, so, I re- so a couple of years ago, I started writing a blog um, about people, including myself, who make excuses for not doing things they say they want to do. Mm-hmm. So that's why the blog was called Excuses Versus Life. Mm-hmm. And then I started thinking about me moving overseas because I'd traveled a bit before this. And I thought, well, why can't I live overseas for a year just to see what it's like? And <laughs> I started thinking maybe it'll be too hard because of my disability. And I thought, yeah, I'm just making excuses here. Right, right. Uh, so I, I, you, um, you might want to know why I chose Paris, and the actual truth is that Paris seemed like the most difficult city to live in. So, so I thought it would be one of those places that would be so difficult it would at least give me lots of challenges that I hadn't thought of. Yeah. And also, having lived there, not lived there, but I've been there for five weeks beforehand. Um, I thought it wasn't that difficult in terms of access, but all the rumors around the world are that it's terrible. Mm -mm. So I thought I would come and live here and put to rest some of those rumors and let people know that it's actually a wonderful city to visit, even if you do have a disability such as using a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but moving, I mean, that's a big deal. Visiting is one thing, but moving is a, is a, I mean, it's you. Yeah, it's a different ball game altogether. It's one of those things that you have to not think about. You just have to do it. You just have to jump in head first because the minute you start thinking about it, the minute you'll make up all these excuses of why you can't and shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have any commitments in Melbourne, so I had nothing that I could really call a big reason to tie me there. My family's in Australia, but my family's not the sort of family that would say, you know, don't do this or don't do that because we might be affected by it. So that's a really positive thing. That's good, yeah. Um, And I just sort of thought I am the sort of person who will just jump in and do stuff and it may not seem the most sensible way to approach life, but like like I said, if you start thinking too much, you don't do anything. Right, right. So you've mentioned your disability and we haven't talked about that yet. Tell us a little bit more about that. So I have the disability of quadriplegia, and a lot of people have a big misconception about what that actually means. Mm -hmm. It it really just means four limbs affected. So I still have very good arm movement, and I use a motorized wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Um, Other people have much more severe disability in terms of how it affects them, and other people have much less. So I think the main thing is that um, people shouldn't make assumptions about what someone can and can't do and that's why I tend to stay away from labeling I guess people with their disability and talk more about what I do and right. and let people see me through those eyes instead mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but sure. certainly but certainly um in terms of the disability it is quadriplegia and I think if people are interested um doing a bit of reading would really open up their eyes I think to what how it's not often what people think it is. Well, most people have a, a and I well, and I'm pr- I include myself in this. We we know about uh, Christopher Reeves. Uh, yeah, so he so he he's a he's a really really extreme example. Mm-hmm. Uh, like he's at the actual most extreme example okay. of what the disability is, okay. where there is there are people who compete in um, wheelchair marathons and racing and climb cliffs. Wow. Who ha- who also have the disability quadriplegia? Theirs is just a lot less. So, so it's a spectrum. It's a, definitely a spectrum, and mm-hmm. most people aren't like Christopher Reeve, and most people aren't like Olympians. Most people sit in the sit in the middle. Right, right, right. It's, uh, yeah. Very yeah, and yes. So Paris. So you decided to go because you thought it would be a big challenge. Although I can think of other places that would have been a bigger challenge. 
yeah, I third have... world. Uh, oh, yes. Anybody, not just for you. <laughs> no, that, that's very true. I think I narrowed it down to three cities, and that was London, Paris, and one of the cities in um, in Italy. Mm. London, well, I thought, well, I speak the language, so that sort of that eliminated one good challenge that I wanted. Yep. Italy, um, there are a lot of Italian migrants in Australia and in the country town where I grew up in. So I sort of thought, oh, that's a bit easy too. <laughs> so I don't so think that, that's that, easy. <laughs> that left Paris where I very I knew very little um, of the language before I came here mm-hmm. and not very much about the culture. And I'm not one of those people who had loved Paris forever, and I'm certainly not a Francophile even now. Oh. I just I think it's just a really beautiful city, and I just thought, well, why not? Mm, interesting. Yeah. So, so what what have you grown to love about Paris? I think what I things. so I think what I um, love about it the most is that because it's so different in every single way to Australia. Every day, every day I go outside, there's something new and different, and it doesn't have to be going to a gallery or a museum. It can simply be an interaction with a French shopkeeper. Mm-hmm. And because my French is getting better and better now, right. it's a real pleasure to go into a shop and buy something and actually have a, have a conversation and walk outside and think, oh, my God, you know, I just had this French conversation. <laughs> and I must you speak this. And I must make a point of saying that I always refer to myself as walking I never go and I never say, um, oh, I used a wheelchair. I just right. mention, I just say walking because I was born walking, so I didn't suddenly switch mindset when I had my disability. Oh, so sure, sure. Just, just, to, just to, not to confuse people. Right. I don't, I, I don't magically walk around Paris. I do use a motorized wheelchair. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And, yeah. And so, so, for, yeah, so for me, in terms of living in Paris, it's just, very different all the time. Uh-huh. And I know for a lot of people, that's actually the reason why they don't like living here mm. because every day does have its challenges and its differences mm-hmm. and they would like it to eventually settle down and be more like where they come from. But I enjoy the fact that it's very different all the time. So what do you mean different? Like there's uh, suddenly there's going to be road work or things like that? Yeah, I just things like you can get killed crossing a road. Um, you know, that's the traffic in Paris is what it is. Yeah. And yeah. Pe- people do their unexpected things. Um, so that's one of those things that you just have to be careful of. The traffic doesn't always pay attention to the traffic signals. Right. But by the, by the same token, if I'm standing at the side of the road waiting to cross the road where there isn't um, a pedestrian crossing – Someone will inevitably walk up to me and say, "Do you want a hand across the road?" Oh, and okay. and they will walk me across the road as if they're some, you know, charming French man. <laughs> well, so where, so where there's something that's ne- not necessarily great, there's always something great that goes along with it. Right. So in this, in essence, you, you, they they help you jaywalk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, even things like going into the supermarket. Because all the food there is different, that to me is fun as well. Mm-hmm. Um, even going into a pharmacy, just the challenge of ordering something from a pharmacy. Mm-hmm. Again, some people might find that something that they wouldn't enjoy, mm-hmm. but I find those sort of experiences really fun. Um, and in terms of the architecture, it's completely different here because yeah. obviously Paris is much, much older than where I'm from, which is just over 200 years old. Right, right. So there's always something different to see. You might just walk down a street and suddenly there will be a street market there because you don't – there are so many street markets here that there's pretty much one around every corner and they're on different days of the week too, so that's really great. Yeah, they just pop up. They just appear. Yeah. Depending on the season and all of that too. Yeah, and you know, at Christmas time, obviously that was fantastic because there was so much amazing food everywhere. Right, right. And so th- there must be some things you dislike about Paris as well, I would assume. Uh, yes, the cold weather. Ah, uh, <laughs> that's actually that's. I, I thought about um, how I would answer a question when people say to me, "What don't you like about it?" I actually, I pretty much like everything. 
um, except the cold weather. Mm. Of course, day to day, something might annoy me, but sure. it, it only lasts for the time that it annoys me. I don't, it's not something I carry over to the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I was going to say that one thing about Paris is that visitors should probably remember is that if it's a beautiful sunny day, don't line up for hours to go and see inside the Notre Dame, for example. Instead, go for a walk around it. It's free and you don't have to line up and the architecture there is amazing. Right, right. Yes, make the most of the sunny days because it's not yeah. sunny every day, you know. And, 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 yeah, it, and it, it, like today, gonna... it's, it's sunny kind of, but it's cool. You know, it's not freezing, but all right. So, yeah, so you don't like the cold weather so much. Yeah, and, and that's really because of my disability. I don't monitor my – I can't monitor my temperature very well. So when it gets ah. cold, it, it, gets, it gets really cold, and I stay really cold. And anybody who knows me knows I'm not sensible enough to wear warm enough clothes. Mm, okay, okay. So that's, that's part <laughs> okay, of it. Okay. Yeah, coming from Australia, I'm not really used to the fact that it gets to naught degrees. I think, you know, 15 degrees is cold. <laughs> Okay, then you must feel yeah. so. I'm a bit so I'm a bit spoiled. I yeah, think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So apparently, the language barrier hasn't been too big for you. That, that's not one of the things you dislike about Paris. Is that we speak French? Yes, and but and that's because I'm a very confident person, and I don't mind if I make mistakes. Mm. And so, in terms of speaking language, I had a private tutor here for a few months. And that helped me get more confident with my speaking. But the great thing about French people is, and some people don't like this, but I love it. If you speak to them and you make a mistake, they immediately correct you. <laughs> Now, some people don't like that, but I think that's fantastic. Yeah, well, it's a good thing, yeah. That's, yeah, how, you so, progress. that's how you make progress. Yeah, and again, it comes down to I kind of like the fact that things don't always go according to plan. To me, it's fun to go and try something different where I have to use different language. And if I succeed in it, I get very excited. And I walk, down, I walk down the street smiling like a village idiot because I'm so, because I'm so happy. And then I realize, stop smiling like that, Sandra. People think you're mad. <laughs> they, they don't know that you just had this great conversation with, the, um, you know, with someone in the bakery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's really how I... Um, how I live here. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, those things don't bother me. I find them mostly amusing and interesting. And mm -hmm. it really is a lot to do with your mindset. When you move to another country, mm -hmm. you yeah. have, you have to really think most things are just amusing. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you, you try your French and then they respond well to that. Yeah, I have a I, I have a thing that I say to people when who live in Paris or in any country they don't come from. If you're having a bad day, don't go outside and take it out on the French people. <laughs> If you're having a bad day, when you go out because things are different all the time and they don't speak, um, people won't speak English. If you are having a bad day and you get frustrated, that's not the French person's fault. Correct. That's you being frustrated at something else that isn't relevant to the, you know, to the reason that you're frustrated or having yeah. this conversation difficulty. So yeah, it's yeah. important. It's important to understand how you are feeling affects how things go in your day as well. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not one of those super positive people. I think I'm actually quite realistic and I just accept that. This is life here, how it is. Yeah, some days you are good, and some days are not good. That's exactly. That's it's, it it's, not a, it's not a romantic fairy tale all the time. Right, right. And that's one of the things actually that I li like least about a lot of blogs that I read about France is that they make it sound like it's all you know butterflies and fairy tales every day. And yeah, it's a Paris. Really. It's, it's a Paris myth. Yeah, uh, a lot of blogs write about fluffy fairy tales that it's all beautiful and there's macarons all over the streets, you know, yes. paving the footpaths. <laughs> it, it, it is a big old city full of people doing their very best to survive like any big city in the world. Yeah. And that's its very basic standing point. It has unfortunately so many unrealistic expectations placed upon it that 
I don't think it can cope with it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. You know, it's true. You know, people will come across one waiter who happens to be rude and they'll say all waiters are rude in Paris. Right. Whereas I find people overwhelmingly polite and if I come across someone who's rude, that's a real shock to me. But people are rude in every country. I mean, well, Sure, it happens anywhere. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of um, bad blogs that don't tell people the truth about Paris is fantastic, but it's not a fairyland. Exactly. It, it is what it is. It can be gritty. It can be dirty. Yes, there's dog poop once in a while. And, you know, that's just how it is. Yeah, but by the same token, it's – it's got lots of amazing things to see, wonderful food, and experiences that you can't have anywhere else. So, right, right, right. right. Yeah. Okay, so tell me some things that you feared you couldn't do in Paris due to the fact that you get around in a wheelchair, but that you can. Things that have gone better than you feared. Um, I think, I don't think I came here thinking. There wasn't something I couldn't do only because, again, I understand that Paris is a really big old city. Mm -hmm. So I, I do often come across restaurants that have steps, ah. but the one next door probably won't have steps. Right. So I, I, yeah, I definitely, I'm so realistic that, I can't, I can't think of something that I thought, gee, I wish I could have done that. I'll just. Mm -hmm. You've been yeah. able to manage to do mo almost everything you've wanted to. Yeah. I mean, for example, I know I haven't actually been inside the Eiffel Tower because I don't want to, don't really feel the need to go inside when I can see it on the outside. Mm -hmm. But I do know that when you use a wheelchair, you can only go up to the second level right. and everybody else who doesn't use a wheelchair can go up to the very top. Right. Well, I kind of think so. What? Yeah. It it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. Right. That's not something that you care about. Yeah. If so, if, if someone comes here and they've got their heart set on doing something, they're probably going to be disappointed a lot. Mm -hmm. It's better not to come here um, with such a expectation. I always say have, have a plan B in case what you want to do doesn't work out. Right, right. And roll with the punches. That's always yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. to do in life in, in general. In, in general, definitely. Don't put so much pressure on Paris. The access here has improved dramatically over 10 years. Uh -huh. It's much, much more accessible than people think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, how it, long have you been in Paris? I didn't ask. So I, I came here in February 2015, so just over a year. Okay, all right. Yeah, and I've had plenty of time to visit lots and lots of galleries, and I think people would be really surprised. Even French people or Parisians are surprised how accessible it is. Mm -hmm. They they say to me, "Oh, you must be, it must be really difficult for you to live here." And I say, "No, it's actually good." <laughs> and they're like, "Really?" But you know, this door isn't automatic. And I say, "But you, you're there to open it, so it doesn't right. really matter." Right, right. <laughs> you know, I, I think some people come from their own city with rose-colored glasses on about their own city. Mm -hmm. and they think it's perfect, but it's only because they live there, so they're used to it. That's so right. they, ca they come to Paris and they compare it unfairly. Mm -hmm. But really I think maybe they just are looking at their own city a bit too unrealistically as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, because not only are you, do you, are you a wheelchair user, but you also travel alone a fair amount. I also, sorry, what? Travel alone a fair amount? Well, I don't, I don't travel alone. I always do, in terms of um, day trips, I usually do those on my own. Mm -hmm. But I do, I do have assistance in the morning and evenings um, to assist me with personal care things. So if I'm traveling on a plane for, you know, 23 hours, I always have someone assist me with things like transfers right. um, and things like that on the plane. But in terms of day-to-day -day activities, I've taught myself, I guess, to be very independent so mm -hmm. I don't have to be with somebody all the time mm -hmm. because I like my own company I don't always want to have to watch out for somebody else and <laughs> consider their needs and think about what they might want to do right 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 um, now I know that's not possible for everybody with a disability but I like I said 
taught myself to do more things that I wanted to do simply because I didn't want to have to always have someone with me when I could just do them myself. Right, right. And do how, how do French people react to you? Well, French people are much, much different than what they're rumored to be like. I don't really know where the stereotype came from right. that Parisians are cold and unfriendly because to me they're absolutely the complete opposite. Mm. Now, obviously how people react to you has a lot to do with how they perceive you. And if, you know, so even without a disability, somebody might come across in a way that's not very positive. Mm -hmm. So, but in terms of me and my experiences, I find French people incredibly courteous and they will always help me with things without me even asking them. Mm. I could, I could be in a supermarket and the person behind me will get, start getting the things out of my basket, even without asking. And it's not because they're, they're rude. It's because they think, of course, I would help you. Yeah. They think it. They think it's a bit ridiculous if I say to them, "Oh no, you go in the lift first. They think, "No, you go in the lift first. Right. The lift's for you, the lift's for you, not for me." So, they're incredibly polite and courteous, and very, very warm and gentle people. Well, I would good. go. I would more say that they're more reserved mm -hmm. than anything. And maybe some people see that as being unfriendly, but to me, it's the complete opposite. Yeah, yeah I found them good. nothing but wonderful people. That's good. And, of course, I've come across the odd rude person, but, you know, oh, yeah. I would be shocked if it was the land of fairy tales and fairy tale people. <laughs> yes, of course. <clears throat> where would where would be the, th the fun in that? That's right. So what are some, some favorite things that you like to do in Paris? Eat. <laughs> yes, my my blog was not meant to be about food. It was meant to be about my adventures, but unfortunately or fortunately all my adventures seem to revolve around food, so, <laughs> so yeah. You, you go you go to different restaurants all the time or Yeah, so what I tend to do is when I'm going out somewhere for the day, I tend to also look at where I can eat as well because that's a good it's good to make a plan for your daily activities. So you're not just wandering around, particularly when it's colder. It's mm -hmm. better to have a plan. Mm -hmm. So I will um, usually go on Yelp, for example, which is a um, food review website. Right. And I'll type in that I want to eat cheese souffle, for example. Okay. And it'll come up with restaurants that have cheese souffle. And one of the only problems is I find that um, a lot of the reviews on Yelp don't tell you whether a restaurant is accessible or not. Right. So you tend to have to do a bit of research before you go out. Mm -hmm. um, you can also write to the restaurant or send them an email. Mm -hmm. um, if someone is at a hotel, they just need to ask the hotel um, concierge to ring up the restaurant and ask if they have step-free step access. Yeah. It's better not to go out unprepared because you will be disappointed you might really be looking forward to eating fondue and you go to the restaurant and find that the, rev the, the review said it was accessible, but what they mean is you have to sit outside in zero degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a bit of preparation in that respect. Um, I do it and I live here, so I would suggest that a traveler do the same thing. Right, but you send emails. You don't, you don't feel like you need to call them. I don't tend to phone only because although my French speaking is quite good, I need to really be in front of somebody to understand what they're saying. Mm. Um, and on the phone, it's a much more difficult because yeah. you, you can't hear, you can't see what somebody's saying. Yeah. So I practice my French writing and write to them in French, but you can write to people in English. Mm. You know, Paris is not, Paris is living in 2016 and people who run restaurants do tend to speak English and write English. So. Right, right. Yeah, you they don't, might write you, back with a mistake. You know, they might write back with grammatical errors. But well, they might they might even write back in French. But just go to Google Translate and translate it. Right, right, right. You know, things things like that. So, in terms of what I love um, doing in Paris, I definitely love trying out all the fantastic food. Mm -hmm. But I also really just like wandering around and looking up at all the beautiful architecture. Because we don't have things like that in um, in Australia because it's not an old enough country. Mm -hmm. But some of the work on some of the buildings is extraordinary. And you don't have to be 
interested in architecture to appreciate things like this. Right. Yeah, so so a favorite dish maybe? You, I mean, you mentioned cheese souffle. I assume you like that. But what well, else? cheese souffle I thought would be my favorite dish, and I also thought that um, fondue would be my favorite dish. But it turns out that there's a dish called salmonier. Ah, la salmonier. Yeah. Yes, which is basically for those who don't know, fish cooked in butter. Yes. And there's a great scene out of the Julia Childs movie with Meryl Streep in it where the dish, she orders that dish and it comes to her table and she says, oh, butter. And that's exactly what it's like. So <laughs> that's de definitely a dish that I consider very, very French because the French do the whole cooked in butter thing very, very well. Yes, yes. Well, you, yeah, salmonier is absolutely delicious. Any fish cooked that way is good. Oh, of course. Lots I mean, of butter. <laughs> put anything in butter and we're very happy. Um Yes, and the, there's also another great dish they have here, which the French don't call it what we call it, but people who don't live in Paris call this Paris mash, which is basically mashed potatoes, but the French do it with, you know, 80% butter and 20% potato. Achille <laughs> <laughs> so, Parmentier, is that what you mean? I don't know. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know what um, what mashed potato is in French, I'll have to look that up. Well, ashi parmentier would be mashed potatoes with butter and some beef. No, that's, no. that's not what you had no, to do. Okay. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's that dish on its own. Mashed potato is really just potato mashed up to a creamy, buttery deliciousness. Nice. And it's a, <laughs> usually served as a side dish. And, yeah, how, how wrong can you go with that? So do you have specific restaurants that you, that you can recommend? Yes, well, the one that I would go to for the Saumonier and the Paris Mash and a great onion soup is called Café de la Pax. Café it's de near. La okay. Oh, yes, my pronunciation yeah, isn't that pitch, perfect. No. P, P. <laughs> See, now I know. So now, this is this is why you don't ring up and book right. things in restaurants because they don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. If you write it in an email, they understand you oh, much, sure, much yeah. better. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And that's also an example of where French people will helpfully correct you. It means you it <laughs> means you know it means too French. <laughs> it means it means you don't make the same humiliating humiliating mistake next time. <laughs> it's not humiliating. It's just, no, I know. How would you know? I mean, <laughs> it's it's one of the things that, as I said, I really find very useful, and a lot of people don't like it because they think that. When people correct you, they're making fun of you, but that's not true at all. No, no yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story is that when people come to Australia, Australians don't correct you when you make a mistake in your language. Mm. And most tourists get very frustrated because they might come there to study and nobody's telling them they're saying a word wrong mm. and they feel foolish when they find out they've been pronouncing something wrong for years. <laughs> So I think the French thing is much, much better than what the Australians do. Oh, that's good. That's good. So you were saying, cafe, was it Café de la Paix or Restaurant de la Paix? You said that perfectly in French. You must be French. Yes, I am. But is it Restaurant or Café? Which one is it? Uh, you want to go to the restaurant because the Café is a buffet style. Ah, Okay. But the restaurant and the buffet are right in the same. They're in the same building. Okay, so I'll put a, But, I'll put a, an, a, the address and a link to that on the yeah. On so the you show just need notes. you need to make sure. I, I just email them directly. Mm -hmm. um, you can you can book online through the restaurant, but you can also just email them directly and say that you want to go into the restaurant. Mm -hmm. The restaurant is very different. It's it's like a beautiful French style dining room, mm -hmm. and so it's really quite magnificent to be there. Um, it's lots of French people go there. It's not, it's not a, it's touristy for foodies, mm -hmm. but generally it's only French people there. That's cool. That's the service. Place. Yeah. The service is amazing. It's, it's got a sophisticated look about it, but it's not a place you would be frightened to go to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, just go there and enjoy the experience and enjoy the beautiful food. Yeah. That's good to know. That's good to know. Any others that you particularly like? One I would highly recommend for tourists because the um, husband and wife that run it are very, very proud of their restaurant. It only serves um, duck and foie gras. Oh. It's called Au Petit Sud-West. Okay. 
It's near the Eiffel Tower. Okay. And I don't think there's anything else on the menu except salads and desserts. <laughs> that That's their specialty. And if you want duck a l'orange or duck in red wine sauce, mm -hmm. it is absolutely the place to go. It's um, I'm going to sound like I work there, but... <laughs> I take anybody there who wants a French experience. Oh, that's great. It's beautiful. It's intimate. It's friendly. It's relaxed. And when you go there, you can see that the people who have come to eat there are either French or they're foodies who want, who want that experience with um, duck and foie gras. Le petit sud-ouest. Excellent. Yeah. It's, Excellent. It's, it, it's a hidden – not hidden. It's on a main road, but – I don't think many people would understand that because they specialize in only those two dishes, the prices are very, very cheap. Mm. The, the more dishes on a menu, the more expensive a, a restaurant's going to be because that's what they specialize in. Yeah. It's actually, it's actually very, very cheap, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's good also that it's near the Eiffel Tower because I don't know of ma very many restaurants uh, near the Eiffel Tower. I, n I never eat in that area. And so that's really good. Yeah, the Eiffel Tower literally is around the corner. It's that close. Mm, excellent. I, okay. I, I, I think people who go to the Eiffel Tower tend to just go away from the Eiffel Tower onto their next, perhaps the next spot they want to visit. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that around the corner is a whole street full of French food. Excellent. Excellent. So another, another one I really like is um, Au Pied de Sacre-Cœur which is right near the Basilica Sacre Coeur. Okay. Um, it's impossible to find. It took me three attempts <laughs> to find it, but I was determined to go there because it apparently sold things like very traditional French food, such as onion soup and bully bays and duck, but it also has frog's legs, and they're not commonly sold in Paris. No. Um But if you want to try them, that's a really good place to go. Oh, cool. Now, funnily enough, it's not wheelchair accessible inside. Mm. And I do have to sit outside, not on my own. Obviously, there are tables and chairs. Sure. <laughs> they, they, they don't just park me out there and bring my food to me. Yeah, they have a terrace or something, right? <laughs> that's right. And because the, um, but because the food is so good and so consistent, I just wait till the weather gets warmer and I go there lots of times and I don't go there in winter. Yeah, you go when it's warm. That's yeah. good. That's good. Um, and if people like rotisserie food, and Paris does that very well, there's a place called Le Luchibon. Mm. That's in the first arrondissement. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely old restaurant. Um, but if you don't like seeing meat hanging in the window when you walk in, mm. don't go there. But if no. you love ham and duck and beef and pork uh -huh. that's the place that's the place to go to get food like that okay, yeah, definitely. can you spell that name um l e l yeah l l o u c e e b e m e, the e has an accent l wow well, i must have spelled it wrong. i must have anyway we'll put it on the it, website it, all of it will be on the website i've got the link to that and excellent. yeah Excellent. Very and there, is, there are several others too, and I'll um, send those to you as well. Very good. Mm. I'm going to have to try them next time I'm in Paris because – You definitely you know. should because um, they're often ones people don't know about. Mm -hmm. each, each of the restaurants that I've mentioned and a couple more that I'll send to you all sell something very different and all offer a very different experience. Very good. Very good. Do, do you have any hotel recommendations or do you not use your hotels? Well, honestly, 10 years ago, it would have been easier to find teeth in a duck than find an accessible hotel. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but nowadays, many, many hotels here have wheelchair adapted um, rooms and bathrooms. Uh -huh, that's good. So people really not need to not think it's that impossible simply look on the website. If it doesn't mention it, just send them an email and say what it, what it is you exactly want. Right. Um, some, some hotels might say they have wheelchair access, but you really want one that has adapted rooms. Mm -hmm. What I would even recommend is send the hotel a photo of 
what your own adapted bathroom looks like and say, do you have something like this? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, make people's life easier. They might not know what you mean by wheelchair adapted because that's not the language French people use. So you need to be fair and think, okay, well, maybe if I send a photo, that mm-hmm. will help us agree what we have, that we, you know, they have the same thing that you want. That's true. And it's fast because they can see the photo quickly and just respond yes or no. Yeah. yeah. And, and simple things like that will get you much better customer service in um, Paris and France as well. Mm-hmm. If, you'll make, if you make someone's life easier by saying, here's a photo of what I want. Mm-hmm. then people have, don't have to go and interpret what your language is. So, that's yeah, that's right. a good idea. I find that's true at the hardware store because I like to do a lot of projects around the house. Yes. And if I don't know the name of what I need, which is often the case, I just take a picture of it. Well, yes, we can't know the name of everything. Yeah, yeah, I don't know the name of many things, I'm afraid, <laughs> in either language. Oh, that's yeah, well, So uh, hotels, you, you, just, you just send them an email and ask them. Do they? Do yeah, and, and and pick pick a hotel that says on its website that it's been newly renovated. You know, renovated in the last ten years. They usually will say that. Mm-hmm. Um, if they have renovated, they'll set, let you know that it's renovated. Right. That would that would mean that they've usually um, acted in accordance with the new legislation that was here in France that said that hotels doing renovations had to have wheelchair adapted rooms. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, but I've also um, been to other hotels that are very, very old, and they also have wheelchair adapted rooms. So, but you do need to be very clear on what you want. Mm-hmm. Don't make assumptions that the person has understood exactly what you meant, right. because each person's needs are different to someone else, and what I think is suitable probably wouldn't suit someone else as well. So that's right. That's right. Yeah, and you you've mentioned in a previous exchange that we had that. You don't like particularly much uh, travel travel agencies that are geared towards disability travel? Yeah, I have a very strong opinion on I think everyone has the right when they travel to find a room to sleep in at night time. Mm-hmm. So all that information should be free. Mm-hmm. I don't think a travel agency should have – photos of adapted bathrooms on their website and say to the person who's looking at it, we'll only tell you the name of that hotel if you book us as a travel company. We'll give you the names of five accessible hotels. Oh, is that how it works? Well, yeah, because if you book through a a disability-friendly travel company, they're not going to give you the information for free because they want you to book their service. I see. I see. Okay. And I have a very strong opinion that people with disabilities should be able to travel freely. They have enough challenges in their life when they travel that they should be able to come home at night and sleep in a bed that's comfortable and have a bathroom to have a shower in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be a challenge to find somewhere like that to sleep. Right. Right. So I, th- I think that this is my personal opinion. I do think that many of the travel companies that are catered for people with disabilities play on people's fear mm-hmm. that they won't be able to find the things they need. They won't be able to find an accessible hotel. They won't be able to find equipment and things like that. But it's just actually just not true. Mm-hmm. Um, you just need to send people emails and – it's awesome. Par- Paris is 2016. It's not, you know, the 1800s anymore. Right, right, right. So yeah, so that that's why I, I think all that information should be free and publicly available to people. I don't think it should be right. something you have to pay for. Right, right. Yeah, because for me, uh, I mean, a company that specializes in disabled travel will offer other services like you know wheelchair accessible vans and. Uh, you know, maybe accompaniment for a person that has sight impairment or something like that. Yeah. I think those add-on extras are relevant. I do feel really strongly, though, about a person shouldn't – a lot of people with disabilities who use wheelchairs don't travel because they think finding accommodation is so difficult. Mm. So it would be just much better if – 
all that information about accessible hotels was on one website and people could just go and choose the one they wanted and they don't have to – then they can pay for other things they need such as, you know, an accessible van and things like that. But right, right. 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 Everyone has the right to sleep and bathe mm-hmm. and it shouldn't – that shouldn't be what prevents you from travelling. Right, right. And it's a very good point that you make. Just email them, ask them, send them a photo of what you require and see if they yeah. have it. Yeah, and you might be... have to send a few emails, but you'll find I would, I, I would probably email, you know, 15 to 20 hotels. Right. Because you have a, also have the right to choose whichever one you want. Yeah, sure. You, you shouldn't have to just choose one because it's the only one, you know, you found. There, mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of accessible hotels in Paris. Mm-hmm. And what about sidewalks and things like that? Do you find that – does that make your life difficult when – I mean, I'm assuming in Paris, like – in Toulouse, people still park on sidewalks and still, you know, struck sidewalks in many ways. You know, I did hear about this before I came to live here that people tended to do that, but it's actually very, very rare that I find that happens. Mm. And it's certainly not something that I consider a problem. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, I agree. I do see it occasionally, but that's just the nature of people who don't think. Yeah, you, you're, going to, you're going to get those, those in every country in the world, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the footpaths, it's of course there are some little tiny streets where um, it, the street is the footpath is too narrow to use, but there are also streets where cars don't tend to go, so you can just use the road. That's right. You know, just be careful of the traffic, but um, generally the footpaths are not a problem. I, again, I use a motorized wheelchair, so my ability to travel around is a lot easier because I can go longer distances. Mm-hmm. But having said that, I have seen people using manual wheelchairs who seem to be managing perfectly fine here. Yeah. Um, the only thing I do find is that after it rains, the footpaths get surprisingly slippery, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure why, but that is something that I've had to become aware of because I did occasionally – my wheelchair started to slip and I thought, okay, this isn't a very wise thing to do. So I'm more, I'm more aware of that now. And that's something that people should be careful of because, um, in the mornings, the cleaners go out and wash all the streets down. Mm -hmm. So it is important to be aware that when they're wet, they can be slippery. Okay. That's good to know. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. You've, you've, Uh, yeah, sorry. I was going to mention something else. Mm-hmm. I know um, pe- some people who don't travel often when they use a wheelchair tend to use a travel agent to book flights and everything. Mm-hmm. It's just not necessary. Mm-hmm. Just book it, book the flight online as you normally would. And in terms of the disability assistance that you need, you just contact the airline personally. The travel agent has no more power than you have when it comes to getting what you want organized when you travel. That's true. This is something I've learned from problems that occurred where I thought the travel agent had organized something better than I could have. And it turns out, as I said, they had no more power of fixing that or getting me the assistance that I needed. I could have just done it when I got there. And, yeah, that was a a rude awakening. Mm -hmm. Well, you've Uh, got skin in the game. You want it done right. So you're going to pursue it however long you need to until you get the answer that you want. Whereas a travel agent, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, nah. Well, and you've all, exactly, you've also paid them. So yeah. the their job is kind of done. Whereas if you do it yourself, you know what's been organized and you can have a lot more power. And the more power you have when you have a disability, the better your life is because you're not so defenseless when things go wrong. Yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. Okay, so you have, besides Paris, you have visited a a couple of other cities. I don't want to spend too long uh, on that, but, well, no, you've visited probably more than a couple. Let's mention a couple that you've visited and that you've enjoyed. I could briefly mention that um, Chambord, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Chambord, I know Chambord. C-H-A-M-B-E-R-Y. B E R Y? Yes. Chambéry. Chambéry. There you go. Your accent yes. is so much better than mine. 
I absolutely loved that town because mm -hmm. it was surrounded by mountains like and, the it's, Alps. and it's extremely picturesque. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of wheelchair access, I was so struck by the beauty of it mm -hmm. that I didn't really notice what was accessible and what was stopped. <laughs> you just managed it. I'm just like, la, 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 this is so lovely. It's all very fine. <laughs> I, I, w I would recommend that you go there when it's warm so you can sit outside in the restaurants. Uh -huh. they, they have a big marketplace there. They have the old, you know, the old town centre. That's all accessible. Mm -hmm. um, but, again, you know, maybe sometimes you do need to look, look at things through rose-coloured glasses <laughs> and not notice the problems. Right. Well, that's okay. I mean, if you manage in the end, even if you have to struggle for a minute, you, if you manage to find a way, that's great. Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of um, another uh, town that is really good is called Dijon. Yes. That their tourism has been improved greatly. So things like their tramway system is very accessible. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of their streets are designed now that you can walk down their boulevards. They're not um they're not accessible to cars anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the only problem I would find with some of these towns is that it's probably a lot more difficult to find a hotel with an adapted room mm. because that's that's a much bigger issue than whether the streets are wheelchair friendly, I guess. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, but I haven't stayed at any of these places. I just go there for the day and come back again. Oh, okay. Wow. That's, that's going to be a long day because Chambéry is far away from Paris. Yes, I think that was three hours each way. Yeah. But what people who don't come from Europe don't realize is that the tra train transport system here isn't like in Australia, for example. Mm -hmm. It's actually really, really enjoyable and comfortable and easy to travel on a train long distances. Mm -hmm. They've been made to be adaptable, so it's very easy to get on and off. Right. Um, th these are luxury trains. These aren't your average suburban metro train that you're sitting on rattling away for three hours no no the, yeah the, the, these are comfortable experiences that and the journey in this case is half of the um enjoyment of the visit to the town right because you get to see uh, the landscape along the way yeah and you don't have to worry about anything you're just sitting in a train being taken away somewhere so it is half of the experience definitely mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is a this is a bit of we're going to get now into travel hacks for people who are wheelchair users but the the french train service has an extensive disability support system i guess you could call it it's uh, called access plus do you want to tell, tell us a little bit about that yeah what access plus is is if I want to go, obviously not all train stations in France are adapted for people who use wheelchairs. It's just impossible to do that. They're old and the money just isn't available in that situation. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty that have been adapted and there's a website that you can go to to actually see which ones are adapted and which one the Access Plus service um, gives assistance at. Mm. So all, so once you've booked your train ticket, which you can do online, you can book a wheelchair space online, mm -hmm. you then you then just um, send an email or you can do this online as well to the Access Plus service. And what it means is when you go to the train station, you just go to the disability office and you let them know you're there. Mm -hmm. A person comes up and greets you and they walk you to the train station they pull out the ramp from where they store it on the train station mm -hmm. and you get the assistance to get on the train and when you get to the city you're going to, you might think that people have forgotten you, but no, Access, yeah, Plus, is, Access Plus is there waiting for you. Yes. It's an extremely professional service and it would be great if something like that existed in Australia. Yeah, I've seen it uh, at work with uh, people with sight disabilities, and it's quite extraordinary. The only thing I didn't love about it is that... Oh, and it's free. It's free, yes, it's free. You you have to show up quite a bit early to take advantage. I mean, you have to book it ahead, one. You have to book it at least... Yeah, you have to book it at least 48 hours ahead of time, mm -hmm. um, and you do have to show up. They say 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes before time. Yeah. Um, but because I'm 
me, I'm super organized anyway. Mm -hmm. And I would turn up that early to anything just so I didn't miss the train. Right, right. So that some people might find that a bit of a nuisance because they might see it as a waste of time. And certainly it does add more time to your um, adventure. Mm -hmm. But it is just the way it is. And yeah. Right, right. Oh, I, it's very, very good. I mean, when, uh, okay, so I was taking um, a blind person back to the train station and his guide dog. Yes. And I didn't realize that I was supposed to be there half an hour early, and he didn't tell me or oh, told me. Oh, dear. I didn't hear it. So off we go, and we've got 10 minutes to spare. Oh, dear. And yes. when we showed up at the office, they said, well, it's too late yeah. for us to do that. So I just grabbed him and... We almost ran to the... Ran like the wind. Yes, and um, I just found the, the TGV conductor. I mean, the person who... The, whatever it's called, the person uh, yes. that's on on the ground, who's going to stay on the ground, but tells the train, you can go, you're safe to go. And yes. I said, I'm putting him on. Don't go with me on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, yes. You know, it, was, it was a rush and not pleasant. The same yeah. time, it was very nice because we were early and it was all relaxed and um, they they took care of him and they took him and there was yeah, no well, running and no stress. I went to Dijon a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months ago now, and I wrote a blog post post about this experience because here's an example of why you don't turn up too late because you're excited about the trip and unfortunately the taxi I had ordered didn't come on time so I got to the train station late. There was probably about 20 minutes before the train left mm. and the people in the office said, no, sorry, you can't get on the train. Right. And I was – Oh, well, I just burst into tears. You know, the really useful thing to do is just burst into tears, which, sure. of course, of course, it changed absolutely nothing because they still wouldn't let me on the train. <laughs> now, luckily, trains run regularly to Dijon, so they said you can just get the next train in an hour. Mm. But I learnt my lesson. Don't catch taxis when you want to be somewhere on time and make sure you always turn up ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. It's, it does add some time, but the service is extraordinary. And the way you can recognize them, they all wear a, a red jacket. And Yeah, it really is a, a quite extraordinary service for someone from a country where the transport system isn't great. Mm-hmm. To me, this is why I train travel around Europe, because it's so easy. It's just so easy to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in French, we call them les, les gilets rouges. So, just in case you want to talk to them, uh, Monsieur le Gilet Rouge. <laughs> and my French accent will be that they'll say, "What? Who do you want?" There are other other um, bits of advice I'd give to people using wheelchairs. Yeah. Was don't pre-book tickets to museums, etc. Mm. You might you might think it's helping you be organised, but most museums are free. Right. So you're better off just turning up and finding a security guard and asking them where the disabled access is. Yep. And you just go to the ticket counter, but usually someone will see you and they'll say, no, no, you go first. And if you're not sure, just ask, are the tickets free? And they'll say, yes, of course they are. Mm-hmm. Because in, in France, they think it's ridiculous that that you have to pay if you have a disability. They just think that's your right to enter the museums um, for free. Right. Um, so don't, don't pre-book anything. Just march up to the front ahead of the queue Mm -hmm. and they'll see you and they'll let you in. Right. It's like for for minors, minors usually get into the museums for free or... I think if if you're under 26, you get in for free. If you have a disability, you get in for free. If you're a war veteran or over, I think, 65, you get in for free. Mm -hmm. So there's very few people actually paying to get into the art galleries. (laughs) Eh, that's okay. <laughs> that's why we pay the taxes. <laughs> yes. I would, ma- I would make sure people organize their day. Mm-hmm. Don't go out. Paris is huge. You'll end up being so tired that you won't have fun. Mm-hmm. Organize it, and then if you want to go off the beaten track, do so, but at least have a plan first of all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of accessible toilets, yeah. again, again, 
Paris is actually living in 2016. Okay. It's it's not the old city people think they have. So you can find toilets in places like Costa Coffee, Pret a Manger, McDonald's, KFC. Mm-hmm. Um, there are free accessible toilets on a lot of a lot of the streets. Mm-hmm. They're self cleaning and they're very very easy to use. Yes. Um, places like Galleries Lafayette, which is a big department store, mm-hmm. big department stores all have accessible toilets in them. Mm-hmm. So, and I'll put the links on the website for all of these places. Yeah, so I would just this is the name of the places. Yeah, you can even just do a Google Map search before you go out and see where these places are, and maybe take that map with you. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that way, if you need to, you can easily find one. But you've just got to be more creative. You know, who would have an accessible toilet? Your restaurant may not have, but restaurants in Melbourne don't all have accessible toilets either. Mm-hmm. So don't judge Paris unfairly in terms of their accessibility. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you just need to make a plan so that you can have a few stops throughout the day. Yeah. You know, places that are... One thing I would recommend people do, particularly if they don't speak French is take photos of their equipment that they want to rent or purchase or in case they have a problem and theirs breaks down Mm -hmm. and take photos of your medical supplies, Mm -hmm. any creams or lotions or potions that you use. Yes. That That way when you go into a pharmacist, you can say, you can show them the photo and say, I need this. Yes. But they might not have the same product in France, but they'll have an equipment. Um, they'll have an equivalent. Right. And so they can just look it up on the internet and they'll find the equivalent for you. So right. Right. That, that way you don't have to bring half Everything. your yeah. pharmacy with you. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can also buy things on Amazon.France. Mm-hmm things that you might need Mm -hmm. um you can you can pre-order them and get them sent to your hotel room yeah that's that's something i do Mm. so i don't have to take lots of luggage um with me as well Mm -hmm. so as far as equipment is concerned you can rent equipment in france if you need anything specialized yes and doing a bit of research for this conversation i actually found out information that i wish i'd known about because (laughs) It's, there's actually, there's a fantastic website that um, has been organized by someone in France. I think it's Paris Info, which I don't know whether you know that website or not. Yeah, I go to it frequently. Well, they have a whole list of places in Paris where you can buy or rent medical equipment Mm. and and supplies, like basic um, disability supplies. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I know for a fact one that I use to go and get my wheelchair service, mm-hmm. um, there's, there's an English-speaking chap that works there. So don't be – if you have all this information on hand, don't be worried if you go to Paris that you have to have everything you need. Look at these websites beforehand. Again, email them with a photo of, for example, the shower commode you might need or the type of wheelchair that you use mm-hmm. and and see if they have them to rent and how much it is and get it all organized before you go. Right, right. But, but yeah, there's a wealth of – you don't need to go to a specialized company mm-hmm. and trust them and pay them a lot of money. You can actually just rent it in, Fran- in, yeah, in France. Do you find that the cost of uh, – pre-ordering and all of, I mean, I suppose the equipment you're going to need, whether you're home or not, right? Is, yes. Is it costly? Is it more costly in France or is it about the same? No, it, it's about the same. It's about the same. Right. Yeah. Um, because I've just found that when I've used a specialized equipment hire company, mm-hmm. they, again, don't really have your best interests at heart. Mm. They they just want to supply you with the item that you've ordered. But each person with a disability has their preferences of what type of equipment suits sure. them best, and they have a right to choose that equipment. But I've had a situation where I've come to a hotel room. This wasn't in France having pre-ordered a piece of equipment from a specialized company. Mm -hmm. And what turned up to me was like, oh, my God, I can't use that. Uh uh So at least if you go to a um, specialized 
um, equipment hire company yourself, what, one that's located in the country that you want to go to, like France, mm -hmm. you can make sure they have what you want to order. Right. You don't have to rely on a random generic company who doesn't really have your best interests at heart, I don't think. And do they deliver to the hotel? Yeah, they would absolutely deliver, absolutely. And again, I mean, if you're staying at a hotel, ask the hotel concierge to help you. Right, right. If you have any, that's that's their job. They they want to do things like that. Right, right. Yeah. If, you're, if, you, if your wheelchair battery charger suddenly doesn't work, The, the hotel staff are there to help you. Right. You, do, you, you, don't, you, you don't have to um, climb these big mountains yourself. Someone is there to help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very good. That's very good. Yeah, I think people will find this link really, really useful. Very good. So, yes, I will put links to all these names and places that we've uh, mentioned on the, on the show notes for this episode. Mm -hmm. And you can just tap on your phone and you can get to it straight from the device where you're listening to the show. So I'm, I'm yeah. making it easy for you. <laughs> yes. And I've also, um, I'll also include things such as where to find a private van and driver with an accessible van That's in case, in, ca in case you want to do a tour. Um, mm -hmm. I'll put on information such as how to book a taxi online. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Wow. That's, all, that, all that sort of stuff that people need. That's really great. That's really great. Yeah, because there are a lot of things that I don't even think about, you know, because I... I well, I mean, why, I why, why, would, yeah. why would you? I mean, right. even, even, I mean, I don't, I only think about things that I need. So that's why when I was doing some research for our talk today, I thought, you know, what, what do other people actually need? Just because I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean other people know what they're doing and that can be the fear that stops them from traveling. Yeah. So if, if all this information can make someone think, oh, wow, that really is possible, yeah. I, I want to visit Paris now, mm -hmm. then, that, then that would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there, I was this morning I was browsing the Internet a little bit, as I do every morning, and I found this, this whole thing about how there are a lot of ways you can spend your time and your money But yes. very few are as satisfying as travel. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it, it's it's very very enriching because I think what travel does is it tells you a lot about yourself and your character and your capabilities. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you buy a piece of clothing, you just wear it, but there there, there isn't that. Um, internal satisfaction that comes from that. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you've been challenged and shown yourself that you are more capable than you think you are, and this is people without disabilities too, sure, you really, it really does help you live your life in a different way. Mm -hmm. And there's, yeah, I don't think anything but travel really gives you that opportunity. You know, when th that's why when things go wrong, I don't worry about it well I, I you know I worry about it at the time like I you know might burst into tears but the, but but then I think yeah but didn't I handle that properly didn't I, I was able to I was able to brush that aside and say fine I'll take the next train an hour later and exactly yeah and it exactly. sort of shows you that you are the sort of person who can do more things than perhaps you think you can yeah that's that's wonderful yeah I really think that having a disability shouldn't stop anybody from doing the things that they want to do. You know, if it, hopefully there are ways you can adapt and it's your, you know, and I think you, you have, you know, like I, I know I can't run a marathon. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. So I, so, so you don't run a marathon. You right. might, you things. might, you do other things instead. And, and that's what people shouldn't think. Oh, you know, I couldn't go to Paris. Well, maybe just start off small Mm -hmm. and do something more local, mm -hmm. but just test your boundaries a bit and you'd be quite surprised that plenty of people want to give you a hand as well, no matter where you go. That's great. And that it's not all that difficult. And I also think don't expect things to be exactly like they are at home. Sure. Be because they're not going to be. So don't. That's, don't, that's true it's, for everyone. I'm yeah. Everyone. If you don't, go to France and you want your coffee to taste the same as what it tastes like at home, where well, you're going to be sorely disappointed because it's then not. Then, yeah, you probably shouldn't travel if you're not adaptable. Right. You really do need to think, oh, wow, isn't that different 
Yeah. You know, and yeah, just appreciate the differences. Yeah. And if things get too bad, just have some wine. <laughs> and everything will be fine in the morning. Exactly. I agree. Yeah. I'm good with that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't have great over expectations of anywhere you travel to. Yeah. Just enjoy it for what it is. That's great. Yeah. That's great advice. Any other pearls of advice before we part? Because we've been talking a long time. I know. That, uh, <laughs> I guess that's what happens though when you have something to talk about. You just that's right. that's keep right. talking. It becomes more interesting than, than you realize. Yes. But I think, I think the main thing is really just encouraging people to stop making excuses. Right. Because everybody can make excuses and you're not the person who's got the most excuses. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, so, yeah, we all have things that get in our way, obviously. You know. Definitely. You're, we wish you're, we had more money. We wish we had. We were younger. We wish blah, 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 we, whatever. Yeah, but it is, life is what it is. And yeah. Yeah. yeah just, make the best that you can. Make, make of it what you, what you can. But don't, don't stay home and see nothing and do nothing, as a, you know. Yeah, because really in the end, most of the reasons that we – say we can't do something is really just a big fat excuse. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the theme of your blog and of your that book, is right? the theme that is the theme of my blog. It's um really think realistically. If I really, really wanted to do this, would I do it? And if you don't really want to do it then you probably won't. So Yeah. Right. You have to be selective too. It doesn't mean just be you know, you have to be selective and go after the things that matter to you. Yeah, and I, I, I certainly wouldn't suggest everybody drop everything and sell everything and move overseas to a foreign country. Right. Um, you know, I did things to make this happen, but I also made a lot of sacrifices to make this happen. Mm -hmm. I'm not lucky and I'm not fortunate and I'm not better off than anybody else. I you just did, made it happen. I just wanted to make this goal mine, and so I did it. Mm-hmm. Um, do you stay? You think you'll stay in France? Um, do you have any idea? No, I don't have any idea. I will see how I go this summer. Mm -hmm. I'll think about the winter. Mm -hmm. um, I'll keep. Re I've got to renew my residency to stay here mm -hmm. um, every year. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll just see where life leads me. Really, sure. That I can. I can do that, and that's how I like to live life. So yeah, that's, that's what great. I'll do. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I will obviously put links to your social media and to your website. On, thank you, Annie. Uh, join us in France. It's been lovely talking to you. You've, you've brought a lot of, you know, you have a wealth of knowledge about these subjects that few people have. And it's not the type of information that's readily available in this format anyway. I've, you know. It's no, it's not easy. I know people have said it's not easy to find. Mm -hmm. And it, often it's, experiences from people who don't live in Paris yeah and I do live here so I think I right. I know I know up-to-date information right and information that was sourced five years ago mm -hmm. isn't isn't always correct exactly. now so exactly you have to be careful what you read online because it's old that, that's why I really like the, the fact that you've emphasized email the place and ask them, you know. Yeah, don't you, believe everything yeah. you read from five years ago or even two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Someone someone might have been here two years ago and said something wasn't suitable. I can guarantee you it's been changed. Right, right. Yeah, because they, they do make an effort for accessibility. And actually it's kind of funny because the type of accessibility that is needed for wheelchairs and for uh, blind people is very different. Mm -hmm. but, exactly. You know, because wheelchair users want everybody, everything to be smooth so they can easily move along. Well, for a blind person, they want to have a curb because they want to know that this is where the street starts. Yes, and I think a lot of people wouldn't understand that. Yeah. That that that's exactly correct. Right. So, so everybody, the, everybody has different needs. Right. So just saying it's accessible doesn't mean very much. It just depends on what you need. And, um, and either way you can adapt, you know, you can have curbs and then have places where you can get off the curb and cross. Road yeah. And you that. know, and for, for me personally, I wouldn't want Paris to be 
all completely wheelchair accessible because there wouldn't be any adventure when things went wrong. <laughs> if everything went right all the time, it would be a really, really boring blog. <laughs> All right, that's a great spot to end on. That's All that's right. the spirit of the whole thing. Is it is pretty much the spirit of the whole thing. Yes, enjoy life, even if it uh, even if it does even, even if it does put a curb in your way. Just turn around and go another direction. Thank you so much for all the great recommendations and uh, best of luck on your book. You'll keep us updated and let us know when it's published. I will. Thank you very much, Annie. It's been fun talking to you. Thank you, Sandra. See you. All right. Bye-bye. If you enjoy the show, let us know. Many thanks to listeners who donate to the show or use our Amazon and hotel booking links on joinusinfrance.com or on the show notes on your phone. Most people who find the show do it through a recommendation from a friend. If you share the show with a friend, let me know so I can fuss over you and thank you properly. The other way people learn about the show is through mentions on TripAdvisor, travel sites, and blogs. Thank you for dropping our name here and there. It really helps, and I'll be happy to fuss over you also if you let me know. Thank you. Have a great time in France, and when you come back... Consider sharing your experiences in France with the other listeners. I really enjoy doing trip reports with you. Au revoir.